All right, let's look at some graphs of inverse functions and see what a function and its inverse look like on a graph because there's something really interesting that happens. And so let's start with a graph like this. Let's start with y equals 1 over 3x plus 4. Let's go ahead and graph that line and see what the inverse of that looks like. So y equals 1 over 3x plus 4 is going to intersect the y-axis at 4, and then the slope is up 1 over 3. So up 1 over 3, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 3. And then it would also be down 1 to the left 3 going the other way. So here's our line. And remember that what an inverse function basically does is instead of sending the inputs to the outputs, it kind of reverses it and puts the outputs to the inputs. So if you have a graph, what you should do is say, so this is the point negative 3, 3. That point right there is negative 3, 3. What you do is you flip the x and y, and then that point is on your inverse function. So 3, negative 3 would be on our inverse function. So here's the point 0, comma 4. So that means 4, comma 0 would be on our uh, inverse function. So there's the point 0, 4, which corresponds to 4, 0. And so you notice that instead of the slope being up 1 over 3, it kind of is up 3 over 1. So let's do one more point. Let's do this point. This is the point 9, 1, 2, 3, oops, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's the point 9, 7 right there. And so that means the point 7, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 9 is going to be on our graph. So let's connect those points. And you can see that our function and our inverse function, you know, they, kind, they do cross each other, and there's something special about where they cross. Here's the line y equals x, just up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, going through the origin. And what you'll notice is that a function and an inverse basically reflect over the line y equals x. And so this reflects over the line which becomes this, and vice versa. Also notice that whenever a inverse crosses the regular function, that crossing will have to happen on the line x equals y, because that's the only way it's possible for it to be reflected. So why does it reflect across the line y equals x? The reason is related to how we're flipping our inputs and our outputs. As you can see, uh, 0, 4 went to 4, 0. Negative 3, 3 went to 3, negative 3, and so on. It creates this reflection pattern. Let's look at another function we're used to, uh, just y equals x squared. As you know, it's up 1 over 1, over 2 up 4, and over 3 up 9. And it's an even function, so it's reflected across the, uh, the y-axis. So here's our y equals x squared graph. Let's see how this gets affected by its inverse. Okay, so we notice, by the way, that this is not an injective function because we have multiple x's going to the same y values. So keep that in mind as we look ahead. So we go 1, 1 is on the graph. So that point will actually also be on our inverse graph. So 1, 1 flips is 1, 1. That's why it has to be on the line y equals x. How about negative 1, 1? Where does the point negative 1, 1 go? Well, negative 1, 1 would go to 1, negative 1, okay? Here we've got the point 2, 4, over 2, up 4. So reverse those, up 2, over 4. So in other words, over 2, up 4, instead went to over 4, up 2. Likewise, here's the point negative 2, 4. So that would go to over 4, down 2. Again, I'm just switching the x and y's. That's all that's happening here. You're wondering, where is he getting these points from? I'm just switching the x and y's. So instead of negative 2, 4, it's 4, negative 2. If you keep going in that way, what you discover is that the graph looks like this. It basically turns the parabola on its side. So that's why, and you notice that this top half is the square root function. And that's why the square root function is the inverse of the x squared function. They kind of undo each other. 
Notice also that we're reflecting across this line y equals x. And so we reflect across that line, which turns us sideways. Let's look at one last example. Let's do a circle with radius 2. So let's do a circle that has a center right here. So a center of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the center of the circle is negative 5, 5, and we'll go a radius of 2. So how would, notice how I'm drawing this. How would this be affected by finding its inverse? Okay, so there's our center, negative 5, 5. Well, basically all I have to do is just regraph the center, and I can regraph the new circle. So now the new center of the inverse function would be 5, negative 5. So right there is the point 5, negative 5. And again, we have a radius of 2. And you can see how this is a reflection across the line y equals x. And so the further away you get from the line y equals x, the further away you get on this side as well. And remember that the only place we're going to intersect is when uh, we have a y and an x that are equal to each other, because that way when you flip them, it's the same point. So hopefully that makes sense of inverses on a graph. Um, let's do these last two problems. Are these two functions inverses of each other? We have f and g. And so the best way to tell if two functions are inverses of each other is to do what we did in the previous video, which is find f of g of x and g of f of x. If both of those equal x, then we know that these are inverses of each other. So let's find f of g of x. So take f, and every time you see x, replace it with all of g. So that would look like this. It would be 3 over replace x with 3 over x plus 7. So this 3 over x plus 7 replaced that x. And so you see we still have minus 7, so we still need a minus 7. Okay, let's see what happens. 7 cancels with negative 7, so we get 3 divided by 3 over x. which can be rewritten as 3 divided by 3 over x. Now you know what to do, copy dot flip, 3 times x over 3, 3's cancel, and we're just left with x. So f of g of x works. We get x just like we want, but we also need to check g of f of x. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's do g of f of x. Okay, and let's see if we get x this way. So take g, and this time, every time you see g, every time you see an x, plug in all of f. So this is going to be 3 over, and now we need to plug in x, 3 over x minus 7. And then g has a plus 7 at the end, so we need that plus 7. So notice how this is g of x, 3 over x plus 7, except that instead of writing x, we wrote f, which is 3 over x minus 7. How do we simplify this? Remember that this is 3 divided by 3 over x minus 7. That's another way of writing it. And now you just do copy dot flip. So that's the same as 3 times x minus 7 over 3. Okay, so you see that the 3's cancel. And so this simplifies to x minus 7. So that only piece right there simplifies to x minus 7 but we still have the plus 7 on the end. I didn't write the plus 7 up here, but we still have the plus 7 on the end, so those cancel, and we just get x. So these two functions are inverses of each other because f of g of x equals x and, and g of f of x equals x. We have time for this last example. Again, we're going to follow the same procedure. Let's find f of g of x. So take f, and every time you see an x, replace it with all of g. So this is going to be 6 divided by, instead of x, I write 3 over x minus 4 minus 4. Or, I'm sorry, this would be 6 divided by 3 over x minus 4 plus 2. So let's take a look at that. Is this going to simplify? Hmm. You see that it's not going to clean up as nicely as the previous one did. Um, one thing I could do is I could multiply, well, first off, we need to get this bottom into one fraction down here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply 2 by x minus 4 over x minus 4. 
because that way I'm going to have a common denominator on the bottom, and that's going to allow me to make this into one fraction. So in other words, this becomes 6 over 3 over x minus 4 plus 2 times x minus 4 over x minus 4. Do you see how I did that? I have 2 over x minus 4. 2 times x minus 4 over x minus 4. And so now I can add these together. So let's come up here. This is going to equal 6 all over. You probably have a feeling that this isn't going to work out already, you know, just because how much mo more messy this is. So on the top, we have 3 plus 2 times x minus 4. That's the numerator plus the numerator. All over x minus 4 on the bottom because the denominator just carries across. So that's nice because now we can uh, do copy dot flip. So that's going to be, when we do copy dot flip, that's going to result in 6 times the denominator, 6 times x minus 4, over 3 plus 2 times x minus 4. Now if that's, the, I kind of skipped a step there, but basically what I did was I just did copy dot flip. I did 6 divided by 3 plus 2 times x minus 4, all over x minus 4. And then when you do the copy dot flip, you multiply the fractions and get this. So let's simplify this a little bit more. On the top, we're going to have 6x minus 24. And the bottom, we're going to have 3 plus 2x minus 8. And essentially what you're seeing here is, no matter how much I try, that simplifies to 6x minus 24 over 2x minus 5. And there's just going to be no way that, again, this says 6x minus 24 over 2x minus 5. And there's just no way those numbers are going to cancel. At most, I could factor the 6 back out. In fact, it's easier if you leave it factored. So I should have left that as 6 times x minus 4. And there's nothing that factors out of the bottom. So there's no way that's going to simplify. Once you have it in factored form, like 6 times x minus 4 over 2x minus 5, you see that's in factored form, and the stuff's not going to cancel. So that means these two functions are not inverses of each other, and uh, that's all you can do. So you simplify until you can get it into factored form, and then if the stuff doesn't cancel, you can be confident that it's not going to be x, and so they're not inverses of each other. This kind of algebra is going to be useful when you get to calculus, so it's good to practice this kind of fraction manipulation now. We have three more examples to do, and we will finish off section 4.1 in the next video. See you there.